you positive heads out there. Thanks for tuning your beautiful brainwaves into another episode of the Positive Head Podcast, where we are firmly convinced that creating success and happiness is rooted in understanding the ultimate nature of reality and the fact that as human beings, we are all immensely powerful fractals of the one and only source consciousness, which creates and animates all things. Now, of course, understanding this powerful truth is one thing. Applying this incredibly empowering wisdom to everyday life? Well, that's another. Which is exactly why we provide you with a fresh serving of soul food for thought five days a week to help constantly remind you of what matters most. You are it. And I'm your host, Brandon Beecham. I'm the reflection and extension of you who will be here each Wednesday interviewing a different consciousness change maker. And on the other four weekdays, leading the way to ensure that your perspective is consistently expanded, your vibration is constantly elevated, and your heart is overflowing and full. Also, before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a few sponsors that not only help to make it possible to produce this show five days a week, but that I'm also genuinely passionate about promoting especially since they're helping to fund all the cool projects we have in the works, such as the Positive Head app, the docuseries that I'm intending to begin shooting within the next year, and whatever else we dream up over here at Positive Headquarters to help spread consciousness across the planet. Now, if you're short on time or just super excited for today's topic and want to dive right in and skip these ads, feel free to fast forward about four minutes to get right into today's show. That being said, I strongly encourage you to listen because the reason I'm passionate about my sponsors is because they've made a huge impact in my own life, which is why I've aligned with these organizations. And I firmly believe they can do the same for you too. The first longtime stellar supporter of this show that I want to mention is Gaia. If you're not familiar, Gaia is the go-to source for streaming consciousness content online with over 8,000 video titles. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. The second sponsor I'm extremely passionate about promoting is Purium. It's no mystery that bringing your mind, body and spirit into balance is necessary if a person truly intends to manifest the greatest and grandest version of themselves. And as of recording this, it's been about mm, four months since I started taking the Purium Core 4 Superfood products every day. And I can honestly and sincerely say my mind, body, and spirit have never felt more in alignment. If you've been looking for a way to easily get superfoods into your system every day with a simple plan that can help you reestablish a healthier foundation and relationship with food, I cannot recommend for you to start with the Purium 40-Day Ultimate Nutrition Plan, which includes a 10-day metabolic reset and cleanse enough. I spent personally months researching Purium before I jumped in, and now myself and over 150 other positive heads have started with the 40-Day Ultimate Nutrition Plan, and many of us have continued taking the Core 4 products on an ongoing basis daily ever since. I personally intend to take them for the rest of my life because they played a huge role transforming my vibrational state. If you decide to do it, it'll cost you just over $7 a day for the first 40 days and only about $5 a day after. But if you do it the way that I recommend you to do it, the smartest and most beneficial way, it won't cost you anything. I recommend you to just look at where you can reallocate money you are already spending on food each day. Essentially, you're just going to swap out the unhealthiest stuff you're in the habit of purchasing in exchange for Purium Superfoods. And this way, it costs you nothing to participate in the transformation and cleanse. And it creates exponential benefit because now you've replaced something that lowers your vibration with something that is going to make you feel super high in the healthiest kind of way. Just take a few minutes, see where you can cut out five to seven dollars a day and commit to doing it. It's that simple. Also for support, we'll be doing a big group transformation with other positive heads and soul family once each month for support. 
So I recommend, you know, going right now, ordering your 40-day Ultimate Nutrition Plan bundle so that you have it when the next group transformation starts. Procrastination is not your friend. Order it now. You can thank me later because I can assure you, you will not be sorry you've decided to send a message to the universe that you're ready to step up your vibrational game and reclaim your health sovereignty. Just head over to ishoppurium.com. That's spelled I-S-H-O-P. P-U-R-I-U-M dot com. Be sure to use the code positive head, all one word for either $50 off or a 25% discount, whichever is greater. And also, if you want to learn more details about the Purium products, why I'm so passionate about promoting them beforehand, you can go check out several videos I shot discussing these things in greater detail. You can also hear my interview with the very inspiring founder, David Sandoval, Much, much more over at positivehead.com forward slash transformation. All right, all you positive heads on this week's Pow Wow episode, I'm very curious to learn and explore with Greg Marcus. Greg is a highly educated spiritual seeker who has a PhD from MIT that's a lot of big letters, <laughs> and is an expert in uh, the Jewish practice of Musar. Uh, in addition to being a successful author, he's also the creator of American Musar, which is a 21st century outgrowth, I guess you could say, of the this ancient practice, which focuses on putting spirituality into actionable practice. Um, hey there, Greg. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Brandon. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, looking forward to learning learning more about Musar. You know, that's a, the the greatest thing about getting getting to do what I do here. It's like all the things that I'm curious about. Uh, I m- maybe not all of them, but a lot of them. I'm able to say, okay, who can tell me? Who can teach me? Who can educate me on what this is? How can we, you know, uh, tie it into all the sort of underlying themes of this show? And uh, I definitely think we're going to be able to do that from the little bit I have learned about Musar um, leading up to this uh, powwow. But uh, what I'd like to do is start at the same same uh, predictable question I always ask uh, when we open up, and that is this. You're in an elevator. The woman next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? And you got 10 floors to answer. What do you say? My passion is helping people find that moment of transformation. I mean, there's lots of things I like to do. I like sports. I like reading. I love my family. But I'm working with it. When I'm working with a group of people, and helping them on their own journey, and they suddenly have this realization about what's been blocking them, what's been holding them back, and they share a story where maybe they showed up as like a better person, they didn't yell at their kids in a situation when they normally did, that's what makes my day. I can live for weeks on just one story of someone... Uh Uh, achieving a moment of, of transformation like that. Ah, uh, I love that. I love that. Um, that's a wonderful uh, response, by the way. And I feel you. To me, it's been the the most exciting thing I've ever done. Uh, you know, I've had success in business and some pretty cool, f- fun times and great relationships. And but I'll tell you, you know, being able to help uh, instigate in any way, shape or form transformation for people. Ah, it's the, it's the best feeling ever, isn't it? And so I, I, I applaud your answer there and I am with you totally on that. And, you know, and it's not the most unique, I mean, it, well, maybe it's less unique these days. I was actually meant to say it's, it's actually kind of a unique, uh, path to be on, you know, someone who's doing work of transforming people and opening people spiritually, right? So how did you end up on this path? I, I'd love to hear the back, the, the Greg background story. Yeah, no, I'm happy to share that. And as you were just talking about this path, I did, um, I worked in the corporate world for many years after I got my PhD. Uh, I moved to, the, to California to do a postdoc. And then I joined the biotech industry and became a marketer. And I was really good and successful at that. And I'm thinking of like some of the big business deals that I closed. And I I got like an incredible adrenaline high from those, but it's really a different quality when you're in relationship with someone else and you're feeling that connection with them, when you're feeling, when you're seeing them take a step on their journey and realizing that's part of my journey as well. So, um, but I was, yeah. I was nowhere in that space when I was in, when I was in the corporate world, I was like, I, I, 
I didn't only drink the Kool-Aid, I was serving the Kool-Aid. I was so dedicated to my job. I became a complete workaholic. I was working 90 hours a week. And then things started to change and I became the scapegoat for a product launch that went bad. That involved me getting publicly humiliated by the president of the company, spending an entire day at a trade show, uh, explaining to angry customers that we were going to have everything fixed. And that night, as I was walking to a bar with some friends to blow off some steam, my cell phone rang. It was my mother and my grandmother had passed away that day. And I just remember standing there in the rain. Both the same day? Both the same day. Oh, and wow. I was standing there in the rain, holding my cell phone in one hand and my umbrella in the other, just listening to my mom, watching everybody else just file into the bar as tears were running down my face and just wondering what was going on with my life. And I was so caught up in the work that, I, that they delayed the funeral for me to finish my time at the trade show, which in the Jewish oh. religion is a big deal. You, you bury people right away. Wow. So... Um, A couple weeks later, it was the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, and that's a day where uh, we fast, we don't have water, we reflect on our life, and I was was still really down. About three in the afternoon, uh, I was sitting, and at the front, they were chanting from the Torah in Hebrew, and I glanced Mm -hmm. down at the translation, and these words jumped out at me, don't turn to idols or molten things. And my first thought, I have to tell you, Brandon, was really dismissive. I'm like, geez, my life is falling apart. And here we are starting with the statues and stuff that nobody's done this for thousands of years. But then this, this phrase jumped into my head. And it was, it was like listening to a, a quiet voice saying, you need to do what's best for the company. And when I heard that, my stomach clenched and my palms got sweaty and I started thinking about oh, what is a corporation, and, and I realized that I had turned my employer into a false idol, that huh. doing what's best for the company, that's what we'd say when we were canceling a pro- project, or when you ask people to cancel a vacation or work weekends, or some of the decisions we made about releasing this product or because it was best for the company, but it wasn't what was best. It wasn't best mm. for me wasn't best for my right. family. It wasn't best for the customers. And I decided that day that I needed to start reconnecting with, with the fundamental values in my life. I needed to start putting people first, putting my family first. And within a year, I'd cut my hours by a third without changing jobs. A year later, I cut my hours by a third again. And wow. while I didn't realize it at the time, that was the moment that put me on the spiritual path that I'm that I'm walking today. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's not something that's easy to do usually. Like, okay, yeah, I'm I, you know, it's one thing to make a radical adjust uh, you know, adjustment in one's life like, okay, I'm quitting my job and I'm going this other path. That's uh, you know, of course has its own set of challenges, but keeping the same job and being able to figure out a way to cut back your hours by two thirds. That's, uh, <laughs> that must've taken some, uh, some juggling. Yeah. Well, i the method I used, I didn't realize at the time, but it was a lot like Mozart. I would look at, at my values and then make a series of small decisions. So the first decision I made was, you know, my health is more important than work. Work may be important, but my health is more important. So I'm going to stop working at nine 30 at night so I can get a good night's sleep. And I'm not going to get up until 6 in the morning so I can get a good night's sleep. And then I stopped working at 8.30 to spend some time with my wife. And then I stopped working at 7.30 to spend some more time with my kids. And gradually, by making a small series of changes like this, um, I got my life back into, uh, back into control. And the funny thing is nobody at work noticed. They, As a matter yeah. of fact, my work life got even, got even better because I wasn't a stressed out wreck anymore well, who mm. would have thought you know yeah. getting a good night's sleep and being more <laughs> present and relaxed would help your career but uh and uh you know i never sent like that 10 p.m email which would piss off a bunch of people and then i'd have to spend the whole day like making it better just by cutting down on mistakes it, i save myself a lot of time too mm. working smarter and not harder right 
Yeah. Yeah. And the, the <laughs> trick was to cut the hours first. But, mm. but when, when I started, when I learned about, about Musar, I realized like what was driving me to work all these hours. Because it, it was like, it was because I, I had a lot of feelings of worthlessness. And I realized that all of this work was an attempt at validation. And you get all these little pats at the head, on the head at, at, you know, good job. You, you got the email newsletter out. You know, that's, you know, oh, you helped close this big deal and we made the money for the quarter and you were really such a great contributor. And I used to just lap that stuff up because it, but it was, it was just papering over a hole that was inside. Mm. And when I learned, you know, when I got deeper into my spiritual journey and learned to really start to look within, I realized what was going on. And that was, that was where the real transformation inside started to mirror the changes that were happening on the outside. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, I'd love to hear more about that piece, obviously. Um, you know, Musar, I, not something that I was intimately familiar with, and I'm sure many listeners aren't. So, and, and obviously that's sort of the path that you've, um, you know, the, the discipline, I guess, if you will, uh, or path that has called most to you. Uh, and so what is Musar? Tell us about it. So Musar is a it's a thousand year old Jewish spiritual practice that mm-hmm. in the nineteenth century it was it became widely practiced in Eastern Europe, but then it was almost lost completely in the in the Holocaust when everyone was who practiced it or taught it, almost everyone was killed. So it's just in the twenty first century that it's starting to make a to make a comeback. And what it does is Rabbi Elia Lopian described it as teaching the heart what the head already understands. I mean, the, the sages like a thousand years ago, they were wondering, why is it so hard to be good? You know, there's all these like rules that are set out in the Torah, but people just can't seem to, to behave in a good way. And they realized that we have impulses inside, good impulses and evil impulses. And by Did you say learned- teaching, sorry, sorry to stop you, did you say um, teaching the heart what the head understands or did, did, did you by chance mean teaching the head what the heart understands? No, it's teaching the heart what the head understands. Oh, okay, okay. All right, go on. I just wanted to make sure I I got that right because I would have if I guessed I'd probably guess it w- was stated the would be stated the obvi- the the opposite way, but I'm yeah. sure you're going to kind of explain that, you know, cuz you think of like the heart as being the the intelligence of love, right? And sometimes we get in our head and then it's like all these other things. Yeah, no, it's it's in- it's interesting and they are two different two different times and sometimes like our our heart will intuitively tell us something and we sort of talk ourselves out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, th- we, what we're talking about in Musar is the opposite thing, where, where I might say, geez, I n- am noticing that I'm raging in traffic and I'm always impatient in traffic. But sitting there going, I have to be more patient, I have to be more patient. Like my head knows I should really be more patient, but my heart doesn't understand that. I see. Okay. All right. So what we do in a Musar practice is we focus on like a particular part of the soul at, at, at one time. You know, the soul is a really complicated thing. Thousands of years across many disciplines, people have tried to understand it. But by focusing on one part of the soul at a time, it's called the soul trait, we do what's like extreme spiritual fitness. Like today we're going <laughs> to work, work on our patients. And then in two Mm. weeks, we'll start working on enthusiasm. And then we'll start working on truth two weeks after that. And during just this focused period of time, we do a a mantra or a recitation phrase in the morning. And then we'll look Mm -hmm. to make one change in our life during the day. And then at night, uh, it's suggested to do journaling, to really think about Mm. where where was my patient's challenge today? And Mm. then to examine that. Interesting, interesting. So it's it's really like, um, you know, t- it, it seems like it, it's it's pretty technique driven, uh, as opposed to just like, hey, here's a bunch of philosophy and ideas about you know the ultimate nature of reality and God and how God plays into your life and things like that. Um, there's there's you know very actionable practices to um, to grow and expand oneself. Yeah, what's kind of cool about it is like these these techniques that the rabbis figured out a thousand years ago and have been writing about for hundreds of years. A lot of them have been 
sort of reinforced and explained by cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, mm, which is right. about, okay, let's just not worry about why this is the case. Let's just make some changes. And right. as we start to take action, what the rabbis would say is each action leaves a small imprint in the soul. What a modern neurobiologist would say is, as you act, you're rewiring the brain and you're creating new right. brain pathways and neurons that fire together, wire together. Right. So we start providing alternative pathways and we start forming new habits. That, and what's amazing is that by doing uh, a practice in one part of our life, it can spill over into another. Like, let me give you right. an example. One of my students, she was, um, she was working on patients. And mm -hmm. she said, uh, okay, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to allow every car to merge in front of me. And she was an East Coast, yell at everybody driver. Her, her commute was just like one curse word after another. Mm. She came in two weeks later and she said, Greg, I am the calmest driver in California. I've just <laughs> let everybody in and my whole commute has changed. I listen to music. It's much more pleasant. Mm. And what's more amazing is she then found herself being more patient with her family. Because as our soul begins to change, that's a fundamental change in who we are and how we show up in the world. And that spills over into other parts of our life as well in a, in a very positive and virtuous cycle. Yeah, I love that. It makes me think of uh, my brother, you know, uh, my brother and I are close and, you know, business partners. And so a lot of times I'm in the car with him <laughs> going to lunch or something like that. And he he has a very short fuse for like people cutting him off or things happening on the road or impatient, just being impatient with someone. And I'm sitting over there thinking like uh, Ryan is his name. I'm thinking Ryan, you know, and I don't say anything because I don't want to agitate him more. But yeah. it's like uh, this person's just trying to get to where they're going just like you. Like, why, what are you upset about? You know what I mean? And what I've noticed is, though. Even scenarios that maybe would cause agitation, um, that, that maybe someone would have more of a right to be agitated for, you, you know, about, uh, if there is such a thing, um, <laughs> it's, they seem to happen more and more frequently to him. And then as a result uh, of this, this sort of trend in, in habit that he has, it, whereas, you know, I'm driving and it's like, I let everyone in, I don't have, you know, I don't, I don't have any of the, I, I don't see any of it in my driving. So I, I actually, you know, what's interesting about it is it like, you know, it, it's co-creating the experience. Your, your, you know, where attention goes, energy flows. And, and so as a result, you know, now I'm sure this person that used as an example is attracting less things that would cause any agitation that are a reflection of this more peaceful uh, version of her commute. Yeah, I think that's that's probably true, you know, and whether that's like an issue of like universal synchronicity or power of attraction or even like, okay, she becomes less aggressive and so mm -hmm. isn't like making people like drive aggressively to get in front of her. She's just uh, opening up more spaciousness in her life. But, you know, when we're more spacious internally, then the outside world becomes more spacious as well. Right, right. Uh, as I always like to say, there is no out there out there. It's showing up as a reflection of your internal state. And uh, so, you know, I love seeing when that is sort of um, reinforced uh, for me in, in in scenarios like this. Now, one question that I have for you uh, about uh, Musar is, you know, how does... Okay, so so it's very technique driven to to work on you know, and work on these different traits, right? How does it philosophically? Where does it fall? It does it fall more in like the traditional, you know, Jewish uh, theology? Is it like more leanings towards Kabbalism? You know, or you know, which is more of like uh, spiritual, mystical, uh, you know, mysticism, Jewish mysticism, as some people refer to it. Um, where does where what's going on on that realm? Yeah, great, great question. And it's a good segue into one of the things that really surprises people about Musar, which I'll get to in a second. So, mm -hmm. Kabbalah is Jewish spiritual mystical, and Musar is Jewish spiritual practical. 
Mm. So it's really like, how can we bring practicality and, and holiness? And there's also this Yiddish term being a mensch, like a person of outstanding character. How can mm. we make our behavior more mensch-like? Mm-hmm. And this, there's, there's a tension within Judaism, which goes all the way, way, way back, like even before Musar was, was a formal practice, which is, is it enough just to do the laws and the commandments that are in the, the Torah, which is like the Jewish, you know, it's the five books of Moses or the, the mm-hmm. uh, rest of the Jewish Bible? Or, and some people say, yeah, that's enough. But there's a whole other strain, which is, no, that's not enough. You also need to do acts of kindness. You know, it's how we, mm. which isn't like, there's no like one law saying you should be kind, or maybe there's some, you know, laws like, like one of the really weird laws is don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind, which I mm. translate as don't be a jerk. You right. know, like only a jerk would put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but kindness, there's opportunities for doing kindness all the time. So it's really about your character. It's the character development path of Judaism. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. Uh, so, it, 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 does that mean then, in a sense, it's not really even, uh, if I'm a student of Musar, it's not even um, really addressing the theological questions like, you know, uh, the, you know, the ultimate nature of reality. Whereas I would say, from my understanding, I'm no expert, uh, for example, Kabbalism is is sort of uh, leaning more towards saying, hey, it's all one and you are it and it is you and and you're, you're an extension of, of source or God or your higher self. Uh, whereas maybe more traditional uh, Jewish, uh, th- you know, theology is like uh, there's this external God that has requirements and, you know, and, and whatever from us. We're, we're God's children, but there's separation in some way there. Um, so does, does Musar just sort of, circumvent all of that it's like hey we don't it's not even really addressed we're just going to talk about working on on your character that's a great question brandon and that is where um american musar differs a little bit from traditional musar practice because within traditional musar and traditional musar writings there's a lot of writing about god like uh one of the great musar books called uh, path of the soul or sorry path of the just which was written in amsterdam in the middle ages this was about um he starts the book saying a person's duty in the world is to be a servant of god and a lot of it is about like aligning yourself with the divine plan and yes there's mm-hmm. a divine plan for everything and yes we have free will and it is when we align ourselves with the divine plan or when we practice musar we're actually elevating us towards towards the divine or towards mm. God because gotcha. only God is in balance across all of these traits. And so when, when we might look at a trait like kindness, there would be a, a, there's a famous reading that says, well, just as God buries the dead, we should bury the dead. And just mm. as God clothes the naked, we should clothe the naked. And so we take inspiration from these attributes of God to behave in a more holy way. Hmm. So when I wrote uh, when I wrote my book and when I founded American Musar, I was trying to reach kind of a broader population where there's a lot of Americans who are really not sure about God. There's a lot of Jews who are not sure about God. So I provide alternatives for for the divinity, and and I'll often write, well, if you're unsure about God, think about it as nature, or think about it as the divine that sits within each of us, the best part of each person. Uh, and those those readings, they can be really um, like those traditional writings. I, I love to read them, but I also have to translate in my own mind, okay, well, how do I show up with this? Because I do share some of that Kabbalistic view of the divinity about kind of God being one with everything. Right. Right. Yeah, I definitely resonate a lot more with that, uh, con- you know, concept uh, than I do this idea of this external creator being who, you know, wants to uh, test us and then judge us and potentially torture us. <laughs> but he loves us. <laughs> and so that just, yeah, that doesn't really align with 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 me either. So uh, I feel you on that. Um so your book now the book is the spiritual practice of good actions finding balance through the soul traits of musar so what what 
if someone picks up your book, uh, which of course is you know available Amazon and I'm sure your own site and things like that, um, what what will what will the takeaways be? Right. Well, one of the one of the most surprising things about Musa, and I forgot to get to this earlier, like when we were talking about patience, the point is not to be as patient as possible. The point is to be balanced in patience. Mm. So if they open up the chapter on patience, what they'll see is a spectrum diagram. Where on the one side, if you have too little patience, you're angry and frustrated. But there's a there's almost as big a problem or as big a problem if we have too much patience. Mm. And if we have too much patience, we tend to end up in bad jobs. We tend to end up in bad relationships. Right. We don't take action when we need to take action. Mm. So the point for all of these different character traits is not to just get, you don't want to be as kind as possible. Right. Because um, if you're as ki- if you get too kind, you might end up as a doormat. Right. You know, it needs to be, it needs to be balanced. Um, right. Or we might actually become untruthful. I'm not going to tell somebody um, that I'm worried about them because they're drinking too much because they might, it might hurt their feelings. Right. And there are some times when we can't allow that, that kindness to dictate our actions. Sometimes there's other, other things that need to come into play. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that makes a whole lot of sense because I think what happens with a lot of people, it's like, and I saw a quote the other day and it said something to the effect of like, you're, you you know, you're not doing anyone any favors by playing small. It's not enlightened to hide your light, uh, you know, because, because you're trying to be so humble and you know, that sort of thing. And, and it really resonates with me because, you know, even part of doing the show for me as someone who's felt such a strong inclination to, uh, teach, you know, learn and teach, you know, a lot of the things that I, I'm uh, uncovering and discovering in my own journey in here in 3D. Um, it's, you know, I, I've wanted to really inject humility into it as well. You know, I, I'm not really into this sort of guru kind of idea or, you know, uh, I think some people really get lost in spiritual narcissism and uh, sort of like, I'm on this, I am the all-knowing Brandon and you are this lowly, you know, whatever. And, and there's people out there who, who kind of get lost in that sort of energy, I feel, and, and at least witnessed. And, you know, that's very important for me to like, the, the more the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And we teach you best what we most need to learn. So I've really been very cautious to inject humility into uh, everything that I do, uh, you know, with this work. But it's also exactly that. Like, I am I would do no one any favors if I'm sort of trying, oh, my only aim is to be as humble as possible. And sort of, like, that's not serving me. That's not serving, you know, anyone. It's like... Own it if you know it and, you know, be be loud and proud about it, but also don't be a, an egomaniacal, you know, jerk either, right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. That is like so perfectly describes like the Musar challenge with humility. Like that's the first, like the first part of the book has like an introduction to Musar and various assumptions and my story and the backstory. But the first soul trait is humility. And that Mm. really trips people up that it's not about being as meek as possible because that's what in the Western world, that's how we've uh, become accustomed to think about humility, but it's finding that balance between arrogance and being meek. And I I so know what you mean about people who get like into the, the guru mindset or the, you know, in my quest for holiness, I've become holier than thou. Yes, and right. That's <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, but that that's not that's what's also known as losing your way. Yes, right. And, um, but it is, um, you know, there's a there's a, a teaching which is often uh, which is from the Bible, which says that Mo- Moses was the humblest person on the face of the earth. Mm. Now, if you think about Moses was a figure who went and challenged Pharaoh, who led a people, who led a people for decades. How could this person be humble? How can you be humble and go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go? Right. And the reason he was considered humble was it wasn't about him. He didn't say, I am the great Moses. He didn't say, look at my magic tricks. He's like, I was sent here by God to do this mission for these people. And 
you know, and he would say, God told me to say this, right? Uh, here's how we're going to get through this. And it, w- it was never about him. And that's what, um, and that's the challenge because I, I, I've, you know, I had a, had a lot of painful lessons about being, um, being arrogant. Mm. Like I, I, I'm much better than I used to be, but when I was in the corporate world, you know, my performance reviews always went like this. Greg, you get more work done than anyone I've ever seen. <laughs> and um, half the people love to work with you and half the people can't stand working with you because you're really arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, in my youngest days, I'd be like, well, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Well, the heck with them if they can't cut it. But right. When things started to go bad, nobody had my back. Yeah, that is a lesson for for uh, all of us. I definitely had to learn uh, humility is it, more of that as as I've grown. And I think a lot of it comes with time and 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 life experience. And you know, the more you go through, the more you start to sort of integrate some of these these m- more mature approaches to um, dealing with your own powers and and uh, you know honoring the the limitations and. And things that we all have, because, you know, when you really understand it, it's like, like we are, we are in this tiny speck floating through this vast, you know, cosmos, like, and then we're a speck on a speck. It's like, none of us (laughs) should be too overinflated when you start looking at the vastness of, uh, not only physical reality, but beyond physical reality, it's, uh, it's uh, definitely important to keep it all in perspective and, and not get too full of yourself. Oh, that is so true. That reminds me of another Musar teaching, uh, which is know before whom you stand. And mm. that's where you can think about that as like the infinite of the, the divine. and Or you can just think about, even if you're not sure about the divinity, just the universe. It's like, look, it's been here long mm-hmm. before you. It's going to be just fine after you're gone. And... You know, we're not as important as we think we are. Right. Now, that doesn't let us off the hook for trying to make the world a better place and for impacting the people that we can impact. But, right. you know, we're one in what, 7 billion, 8 billion people? Yeah, almost 8 billion people. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of other souls here. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, now seems like a good moment to take a quick minute to tell those of you who aren't familiar a bit about our sponsor, Gaia. I've been a big fan of Gaia for many years now, which is why they're the only content provider I've ever reached out to in regards to potentially supporting this podcast. So needless to say, I'm very excited they're now supporting the show. Gaia truly is my personal go-to source for streaming consciousness content on the web. They have an incredible 7,000 plus exclusive videos covering 5,000 years of wisdom. Just to give you an example, on the show Missing Links, the incredible researcher Greg Braden explores all the biggest questions concerning who we are, where we come from, where we're going, by connecting the missing links between science and spirituality to complete our understanding of humanity's history and to better understand the interconnectedness of all things. Awesome, right? And that's just one example. As you guys constantly hear me say, it's a daily conscious effort to maintain an elevated vibration. And if you're looking to go deep down the rabbit hole to do so, then Gaia is the best place I know of to do it, period. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. Check it out. One of the things that you talk about with Musar is just taking... Uh, I know you do workshops and one-on-ones with people and you talk about uh, kind of teaching people, taking them on very small micro steps. Um, Can you, can you kind of give us some examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, I'll start by coming back to a question you asked me earlier, which is what will people find in the book? And for each chapter, for each soul trait, it starts with, you know, there's the spectrum diagram. There's also uh, excerpts from my journal, like I wrote, talk about what I was going through when I was when I was practicing this soul trait. And there's mm-hmm. also action steps. So we, um, you know, I suggest like various actions for people to do. Um, one of the one of the people I was working with one on one was 
uh, she was a yoga teacher and she was having trouble implementing like some of the things that she was training other people. And she loved mm-hmm. to go to the pool, but, and that was like where she just felt like really relaxed and in touch with like something higher, but she'd like go screaming into the, the gym at the last second. And she'd like get out of the, the pool and be getting dressed like a mad woman. And like any relaxation she got, um, was was completely lost so what right. we worked on was just creating some spaciousness and just calendaring out 15 minutes to get changed after she went to the pool right and even if that meant that she swam for 43 minutes instead of an hour she right. left that that spaciousness for getting dressed now it might seem like a small thing and it might seem like an obvious thing but that's kind of where the telling the heart what the head already understands. Mm. And just having like the permission to do that and having like the ability to step back and say, oh, yeah, that, that'll make a big deal. That was life changing for her. Right. Interesting. Yeah, it's um, I think that's one of the most important lessons that I've had as a takeaway recently is, you know, really. And, and I can't. I can't say I've uh, I'm I'm uh, doing this seven days a week, but a lot more than I used to. Where it's you know uh, my eyes open and instantly my brain starts getting flooded with all the things to do today, and instead of hopping out of bed and just going about my tasks, which will never end, right? If the head mm-hmm. knows that, right? Um, yeah. Because yeah. no matter what you achieve, no matter how late you worked at work, there was always more work, right? Uh, That's right. In your example earlier, so same thing. It's like. So instead of hopping out of bed and setting that frantic energy in motion for the day, you know, saying, okay, I'm going to stay here for a few minutes and, you know, maybe sit up and lean against the, the, the back of my bed frame and put on some meditative music, take 15 minutes and just meditate and set intentions, say what I'm grateful for today, then step out into the world. And it sets a whole different tone for your day. And uh, so I think when people understand, like, just creating that space like you said around um any activities that you're doing and you know what i think is really fascinating about that concept is you know as you it's like everything i believe in this world is sort of malleable including time we know time is illusory to some degree and uh, as einstein has kind of pointed out and um so you start you know playing with some of these concepts and it's like you know spending less time doing something but getting more results uh and and just playing with this idea of instead of this uh thought that oh there's not enough time i got to do it this way this way this way telling a different story actually creates the way time and your your world actually starts falling to get together i would say oh absolutely i mean there is when we get into meditation or when we come into presence, I mean, there is also most of it's called Jewish mindfulness, and it's really like getting the most out of, out of every moment. And the, the meditative component of Musar is, is based around these, these recitation phrase, phrases. Like for humility, it's no more than my space, no less than my place, which mm. was written by one of my teachers, Alan Moranis. Cool. And, and when you, chant that for two minutes or you meditate on that for two minutes or 15 minutes suddenly you start noticing throughout the day oh here's this situation where somebody's asking me to do something okay Mm. they're coming into my space with with my request do i hold that space do i uh, by saying no or do i acquiesce to that space saying yes and doing that from a place of what's best for me and how do i relate to this other person is a very different energy than just like, oh my God, this is the fifth time this person's asked me to do that. What the hell's the matter with them? Or, oh, I'm such a slug for always saying yes. Or, you know, hell no, I'd never do anything for that person. But coming up with a, a different energy, it's like, well, they're a divine being. I'm a divine being. You know, what's, how do I want to show up for this? I can respectfully say no. I can respectfully say yes. You know, what's, What's best for me? Yeah, right, right, right. Now, one one question that uh, kind of jumped out at me, I thought was interesting, is um, you when when you wrote your book, you sort of um, you know most books th- that are based on Jewish teachings refer to Hebrew words uh, by translating them into English 
letters. Uh, you stripped out all transliteration with your book, right? Yeah, I did. Um, I'm a, I, so I was a marketer for 10 years. And when I decided to write this book, um, the, the book had, it was based on a class that I'd started. And I had three years worth of notes. And I was going to write a book into, into this, it turned the class into a book. And a study had come out by Pew Research, which said that 70% of Jewish people in the, the country were not members of synagogues. So I went out and I started talking to them, and I found out that, that Hebrew was a real barrier. But it wasn't just, and that, that wasn't a surprise, but the issue was that it was causing shame in people, where there's mm. this kind of indoctrination you get, where Hebrew's the, and Hebrew is an amazing language, by the way. It is so incredibly spiritual. I don't know Sanskrit, but I suspect it might be something similar. There are just certain concepts which don't translate that well. So there is a right. depth and richness that, that come with it. But if um, I, I remembered my own experience where we did a family education program and one of the rabbis kept using this phrase, kol hakavod. And for five years, I was too embarrassed to ask what it meant. And it meant all the <laughs> honor. <laughs> But I'm like, okay, if me, who's, you know, probably as above average Jewish literacy, if I'm feeling the shame, uh, Musa would tell me we shouldn't cause shame in other people. Mm. So if it's really an issue and a barrier for people, I'll take out all the Hebrew words. I put an, an index at the, in the back and I put a, like an appendix with a lookup table. Mm -hmm. So when people are ready to continue their journey, they can find the corresponding Hebrew words. But let's just take it off the table. Let's just not make it an issue right now. And I think that's one of the things that's made this this book so accessible to people, whether they're Jews or non-Jews, that these are universal values that we're talking about. These are practices that anybody can try, and you don't need to, you know, be deeply steeped in Jewish Jewish knowledge or even be Jewish in order to experience the kind of transformation that um, that we can experience from a Mosar practice. Right, right. Very, very interesting. So, uh, earlier you had mentioned, you know, sort of, uh, obviously, it's it's all about finding balance, which I, I think is so key. I, I absolutely could not agree more that life in general is, is about that. Um, and um, you have now, um, as a practice... Uh, in, in the book, one of the things that you talk about is uh, doing something small each day, right? One small step toward balance. Can you give us like an example or examples uh, that, that listeners could do? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about humility. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of, if you think about like a room full, full of people or like a business meeting or something like that, there are certain people who are always going to be talking first and they always right. have to have their voice heard. And there are other Not people me. who might. I've never been, never have I been accused of such a thing. <laughs> no, me neither. This is all theoretical, right? This is a right. hypothetical, you know, a hypothetical situation. So, uh, if hypothetically, you or I were that kind of person, uh, we yeah. might uh, let someone else talk first. Now, the mm. temptation might be don't talk for the entire meeting, but that's too big a step. That's just not realistic. If, if you're a chatterbox like me, there's no way I'm going to be able to sit the whole meeting. It's like my life is a car driving at 100 miles an hour. I'm not going to try to slam on the brakes and stop dead. That's the way to skid and get an accident. But I could get, let right. someone else ask the first question. Mm. I could do that. I could sit there and I might feel that urge to talk. And then I would say my little mantra, no more than my space, no less than my place. And I would try mm. to listen to other people. And suddenly I might hear some ideas. Now, let's say I'm on the other end of the spectrum where I never talk. There, the challenge would be to occupy a little more space to ask right. a question. And if it's too scary to ask the question in the meeting, maybe go up to somebody after the meeting and ask a question. Go up to the right. presenter and ask a question then in a one-on-one -on -one setting for someone who's maybe more introverted. It might be more comfortable one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a way to occupy more space. Right. And there's lots of like little humility practices that we can do. Like one, one that I actually really like is I focus on my parking. And I really try to uh. get between the lines exactly. And I don't crowd uh. to one side or to another. And I feel like 
becoming mindful about how I park just reminds me to think about how, how much space I'm taking up metaphorically uh, in other parts of my life. I love that. Yeah, I find that really um, gratifying to, to do things that are thinking about um, the other you know, some, someone else that ha- how I'm impacting because we're so trained in our life to like, Oh, how can I get the best this or that, or the best deal? That's a good example for me. So sometimes it's like a uh, great example, actually this morning. And it came up for me uh, a couple hours ago. So I bought my, uh, with the holidays coming up, I got a, a gift for my son the other day and at the time, um, you know, I thought to myself, yeah, you know, I bet you a Black Friday sale's coming up and I can get a better deal on this. But I don't know for sure. And I'm just going to, I don't want, I don't want them to sell out of this item. So I'm going to get it. So I got it. And uh, I, uh, and then today, uh, I just received an email from that company saying, oh, you know, Black Friday early sale for all of you. Here's 25% off. Now, this item was not really inexpensive it was like over two hundred dollars so that's a significant difference right and so instantly it came i was like ah i knew it like i could have just saved like money for nothing you know i just ordered this a week ago and then and then all of a sudden i switched to the thought of however you know I am an abundant being and I am so blessed to have abundance, you know, in multiple ways in my life, uh, financially and otherwise. And this is a, you know, sort of a young, small company and I'm actually helping and benefiting them by giving them extra money. And it's not going to change my world that I did. And, you know, those sorts of thoughts. So um, I, I think of that sometimes like we're, you know, a Kickstarter I participated in recently, I paid more than what was asked for, you know, that particular tier um, because it was my, someone that I really wanted to support. So I, I, you know, those are just examples, you know, regarding monetarily, but I I use that as an example because a lot of times our energy is so much the opposite in, in life where it's like, Oh, how do I get as much for me as possible, you know, and get the best deal. And, and then, but if you start actually taking the other side into consideration and like, you know, and then it actually feels good for me anyway. It's felt really good to be able to have that energy of, oh, well, I'm glad I could support extra, you know. And then what I think that does, the ripple effect of that is it actually tells the universe, higher self, God, whatever you want to call it, that you are an abundant being and now you 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 actually attract more for it. So whenever I you know, pay someone more, which is another thing that I did recently. I just voluntarily paid someone more who helps me with things pertaining to the podcast. It's like, my view on that was, well, it actually creates more abundance for me and them because I'm, I'm now calling in more. So you just become more and more of a, of a conduit for the, you know, these energies in this example, it's, you know, you know, financial energy, but it, you know, I think this works across the board when you start taking into account other, other, other use because that's really what it is right extensions of self oh I, I just love that example and there's so many ways that we could look at that through a musar lens as well uh, one of the uh, rabbi iris stone one of the modern musar masters he describes the fundamental challenge of musar is to bear the burden of the other person mm. and it's all about we're so self-focused that how can we align our spirit and our energies towards supporting other people Yep. So we might like one of the soul traits traits is generosity. Yep. So being generous to other people, like I try to tip really generously. I spend a lot of time in coffee shops. I always give a generous tip in the barista jar because I feel like I am thanking them and I'm being kind of generous and bountiful and I'm creating creating more space for them and and by showing them appreciation and recognizing them as people like there was once like when i first started doing this and i went to this you know it's uh, we have phil's coffee in the bay area and uh-huh. once like one year at the end of the year they're like hey we're giving you a five dollar gift card because we just like the energy that you bring in here oh and so cool. that quite literally you know i think created some created some abundance yeah absolutely yeah, uh, we that's... could also look to the soul trait of honor, which is to honor the divine spark in other people and to just give them a little bit extra. That's that's just uh, 
That's, mm. that's super cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm totally with you. Yeah, I had that makes me think of I had a, a friend on not too long ago for a powwow, Charles Clay, and he was talking about a, a practice that he'd made. And you talking about the barista because I, I, if I recall, he used that as an example. He said, "I, I, he, how he makes it a practice to go in and he, he you know, for example, being at the coffee bar and you know, looking to the bar, barista and telling them and sending them and telling them without using your mouth how much." He loves and appreciates them and, you know, with his eyes and with his heart and with his energy and just and then seeing how that impacts um, them and everyone around him. And he's like, man, this is the funnest thing ever to play with this because you start seeing you're not you're using nonverbal, you know, Inner communication and energy to literally shift the room and in in you start seeing the ripple of impact of that and it becomes such a powerful fun game to play and i actually encourage any of you guys listening to try it it is a blast you know make that you're, you're in a place that's mundane or a job that you're kind of like whatever and uh my energy's low it's so easy to fall into those pitfalls start playing with creating and bringing love to that space take that that person at your work and i actually think I, now i just remember this someone wrote me soon after they said oh my gosh i started doing this at work and this person who was like a, 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 like awful and and now and then people i noticed they started changing completely towards me and then people around me even started noticing like wow have you noticed bob or whatever he's like completely different now and it's it's like we are such powerful creator beings that you, I would say the person who cre- recreated Bob is literally stepped into other versions or timelines of reality where Bob is a different energy now. And, and so you start realizing, hold on, this is like all not happening out there. This is showing up as a reflection of me and I can play and co-create in this way. It's it's a whole next level to the way you interact with your world. And it's never boring when you have uh, a game like this that you, you get to play and, and see the results with yourself, right? Oh, I am so going to like borrow that and credit that. And, and then the next, I'm writing a blog post about how you can show up like a mm. mensch at various holiday gatherings. Ah. And that is like one way that you can do that, right? Because we can kind of get by and you can be a good person and an okay person. But if you want to be like a mensch, if you want to be like... Or the uber the, mensch, the supreme, right? <laughs> is the the, the thing. uber mensch, the supremely like cool, <laughs> positive force in the universe. Um, that's like, what better way to do that is to like really non-verbally communicate like love and caring about other people. And mm. even if like, like so many people, like the holidays are just like, a, yeah. uh, in some ways a nightmare because, oh my God, I have to go see uncle so-and-so who I can't stand and they have political views I don't like and they're obnoxious or, you know, my mother says mean things about my weight every year. Yep. But if we can show up with a different kind of energy yep, um, where we're feeling okay about who we are and we're showing out with, with love and abundance for that other person. That is, that is what's, what's what I call living the blessing. Yes. Because I agree. what Musar has taught me is that we are faced with choice points all the time. And as it says, like the, the Musar teaching from the, the Torah is, uh, you know, before I place you a blessing and a curse and you mm. can choose the, the blessing and live an abundant life or you can choose the curse and all your crops are going to weather and blah, blah, blah. And so many times in my life, I felt like, why did I choose the curse in that moment? Mm. Why didn't I, you know, what inside of me prevented me from choose, choosing the blessing? And right. that's where, you know, it's, it's kind of small and iterative. I'm not, I wish I was the kind of person who always chose the blessing, but I don't. But yeah. the more, pra- more I practice even recognizing that I have a choice, you know, I could just drive along or I can see that stop sign and I can say, okay, when I stop, I'm going to stop and I'm going to stop my mind from racing. And I'm just going to appreciate this moment right here and the feel of the warmth or the coolness of the steering wheel. That's a better life. That's a blessed yeah. life yeah. instead of a life where I'm just driving to pick up my prescription or whatever. 
Yes, indeed. It's it's all perspective. And, you know, to, to add to that, what I was saying is um, there, there's a um, – writing from years ago uh many years ago where brad pitt was talking about you know then married to angelina jolie and uh, how at the time um she was you know becoming despondent and anorexic and the energy was really bad and they were sort of heading towards you know the end of the relationship and supposedly in the story uh you know what was he he did was he started just focusing on what he loved about her and bringing her flowers and giving no energy to the, 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 the negative things that were there. And all of a sudden, by focusing on all the good and all the things he loved, and um, all, she just completely bounced back. And like, it, you know, just re, it just changed everything. And, it, and you start realizing like, he, you know, and, and to me, this really rings true. And, you know, I think of people spending time over the holidays to play with this. What better time? You know, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. As Ram Dass said, the most challenging to help you grow are these individuals that are in your immediate family more often than not. And so they're there to sharpen your axe. You know, smooth seas never made for a skilled sailor. Like they're there to help Use the opportunity to take that grumpy grandpa, you know, or whatever, and and and, and recreate them and uh, play with us, play with us, and sending them love and focusing on the things that you want to see more of. And when they go into those moments of the things that you don't, it's sort of like. You know, I, I remember a long time ago uh, interacting with someone and I sort of was going into a little bit of a negative rant or something. And this person, it was like they weren't even hearing it. They were sort of just like, you know, not not in, an, in, in a disrespectful way, ignoring it. But in a, and then it hit me. It's like, oh, they're not taking this on because they're wise enough not to take this on and they're focusing elsewhere. So if you use that as a, as a tool, like, oh, I'm, I'm not engaging in this energetically. And instead I'm going to focus on what that great memory of grandpa or, you know, what I love about grandpa when he's in a good mood and, and laughing and making, you know, jokes and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Like, right. And so you start playing with creating people in, in the, in the image that you want them to show up. Uh, and wow, it's like, it's a powerful, powerful practice that even, you know, it, I forget. And just talking about it, it gets me excited to, you know, it's so playful. It's such a playful, fun way to co-create with the universe. Yeah. I love that, that phrase co-creating for, with the universe. And I'm, you know, that's like a wonderful, I'm sorry to go all broken record about Musar, but that's just kind of how what gets gets me excited is how expansive this practice can be. The phrase that I wrote for honor is find the good in anyone. Yeah. And, you know, there's good in anyone. And yep. it's like, and some people are like, well, you know, what about, you know, some terrorist or whatever. But when someone like takes that route, when they hear that suggestion, I see that as a cop out. Because like, everyone yeah, is acting rational. Hardest- Everyone is acting rational based off their view of the the world. Sorry to interrupt you. I just <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 kind of it. But it's like, well, don't like let your objectioning self kind of interrupt like the practice because it's like grandpa's not a terrorist, right? And yeah, like, grandpa's maybe not politically correct or doesn't <laughs> you know does things that you don't you don't like but grandpa's got a lot of positive stuff going yep, on right you know grandpa was was there for your 10th birthday party with a big present and mm-hmm. with lots of stories about like when your your mom or pop was a kid right and is really in your corner even if he's he's kind of being more grumpy grandpa right now right so if you can find the good in them yep and focus that and and yeah you can coax it out yep you can be like, oh, let's not talk about politics, Grandpa. Let's talk about the time you went sailing around the world. Yeah. <laughs> How much more exciting <laughs> is that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unless Grandpa was a pirate, in which case it's still exciting, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's still exciting, but it's a different, you know. Yeah. Let's, let's avoid the pillaging stories, Grandpa. Let's, you know. But... Show me what's under that patch, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my great grandmother had a glass eye and she would, (laughs) I remember as a kid, she was, you know, probably 90 at the time. She made it to 99. And uh, I remember as a little kid, you know, like, oh, what's up with her eyes? Kind of strange. And 
she just and then all of a sudden she popped it out and like I'm like ah oh, what's happening? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh great grandma, this hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. that'll uh, that answered your question. Yeah, real quick. <laughs> she didn't even she didn't even bother with the patch. <laughs> so oh man this has been fun so much fun greg as as we kind of wind down here i mean one of the last things uh, a couple questions well you know one is i always like to hear stories of synchronicity serendipity positive paranormal stories if you have something uh like that up your sleeve yeah i do um i shared with you the story earlier how i i heard the quiet voice about the you need to do best uh, for the company. Mm-hmm. Well, two years later, it was also Yom Kippur, and I was also fasting, and I was also getting kind of dizzy. And that year, um, I was set to do my first Musar teaching. And uh, we do like these little adult education sessions between services. And I had like, I had this vision where, you know, I thought I was asleep, and I looked up, and like, there was this pillar of fire across the sky like it obscured and it like burned all of the stars and then when i i looked kind of elsewhere and looked back um i thought the sky was blank but i realized that they they it wasn't blank that i could see like a faint like corona around where the stars had been it was like a full eclipse and i could see like these little coronas Mm -hmm. and i realized one of the things i was going to teach for the very first time was this assumption about musar that we all have a divine spark but it's occluded by our baggage Mm. and i realized that i was seeing the divine spark through the baggage which was this moon or whatever it was that was there and i was like you know shaken by this and i was telling a friend of mine and she's like wow you have really intense yom kippurs you know but it it (laughs) It was, it was, a, I felt like a real powerful sending to me. And wow. I still think about that. And I, and I do think I'm really good at seeing the good in people. I do yeah. think that I, it's made me a terrible hiring manager, by the way, because I always <laughs> see the good in somebody and I would ignore like all the obvious ways they weren't good for this, this thing. <laughs> yeah, right, but, right. Um, that was, that was, that was an inspiring and uplifting moment for me. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. What a, what a, what a powerful visual uh you know representation of that in that concept right yeah very very cool well for those that want to connect greg and want to i know you do uh you know workshops or one-on-ones with people and kind of take them through if they have blockages and that sort of thing what what is the best way to for people to connect with you Right. So a great way to connect with me is uh, we start with a, uh, we often start with like a chat where we'll just get together and chat for an hour. And it's particularly good for people who are sort of feeling stuck and they don't really know what's holding them back. Um, It's also, um, I work with a lot of spiritual teachers and healers who can't quite implement their own. Um, So if you're already on a spiritual journey and you want to find ways to kind of implement some of the stuff that you're you're already doing or you're going through a life transition um you can come to my website which is american musar and then slash positive head and we'll set you i'll set you up with a with a, a free one hour chat and consultation wow, we'll just cool. do a lot of listening and i really love love the work you do with this community and i'd like to support them so uh come and uh yeah come and uh join the uh you know, and let's let's set up a time to talk. That's quite gracious to to, to you know offer an hour of your time. Um, very 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 gracious of you. Um, AmericanMusar dot com forward slash positive head. If you guys are interested in that, and Musar is spelled M U S S A R. Just uh, in case yes. uh, you're not sure. So. Um, Wow. Very, very cool, Greg. This has been awesome. I do have one final question I'd like to leave you with. And that question is this. Uh, In 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life according to Greg Marcus? Wow. Okay. So you'll have to decide how to, how to, to do my 60 seconds. I had like a vision about this as well. I it can think, be longer than 60 seconds. I just say that just to right. like give me your, your cliff notes because that is a question in itself that we could go on for hours, right? But yeah. I won't I won't penalize you. Uh, I'll still see the good in you, Greg, if you go uh, 90 seconds or longer. <laughs> so I think the purpose of life, the meaning of life is to 
make ourselves better. I think we were all were kind of born with a particular spiritual curriculum, like things that are, are false to and, and uh, deficits. And our job is to kind of learn what they are and to, to fill them. As we improve, as we become more holy, as we become better, that makes us better people and that makes the world a better place. And I think if each one of us just kind of lived into our purpose in that way of just healing ourselves, um, the, there'd be a lot more life and magic in the world. Mm. Very, very well said, Greg. Thank you so much for taking the time to connect uh, with me today and with the listeners. Definitely enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll cross paths again at some point. And until then, journey well, my friend. You're very, you're, thank you, Brandon. You're very welcome. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Well, everyone, that concludes this week's interview episode. If you have enjoyed this positive download from our hearts and minds to yours, please take a minute, give us a rating or review on iTunes, since iTunes is the holy grail of all things podcasting. Uh, your good reviews help us to reach more listeners. Also, we would be extremely appreciative if you would tell your friends and family about the show. Our sincere intent with the Positive Head podcast is to spread positivity to the world, because, well, because we're selfish, quite honestly. Uh, I say that jokingly, but really only halfway joking. I'm referring to the good kind of selfish based on the knowing that we all get what we give in this life because when we give, we're actually always giving to extensions of self since we're all really one in the same consciousness, just in different bodies. So if you want to be a good selfish along with us by helping to spread the positivity, by all means, please proceed to shout about the Positive Head podcast from your rooftop. <laughs> Otherwise, as you continue on your fabulous journey in this 3D reality, be sure to remember this. As long as you ain't dead, you're already positive ahead. Journey well, everyone, and thank you for being.